Well, hello. My name is Angel Wood, and this is Crime of the Truest Kind. everyone. I'm back from a lovely Maine getaway. I highly recommend. Although, the place that we stayed in, the bed was so wretched that I got a backache. It took me until I came back home from vacation to finally shake it. Mostly. I do believe I will be visiting my acupuncturist in the not-too-distant future. My name is Angel Wood. This is Crime of the Truest Kind, Massachusetts and New England Crime Stories. What's to come? Season 3, True Crime Podcast Festival in Austin, Texas. August in Austin. What were we thinking? An advocacy in action. I will be joining the New Hampshire Coalition of the Missing and Murdered on Tuesday, August 15th in Concord, New Hampshire. Beginning at 11 a.m. You are all invited to join. That's step one of Crime of the Truest Kinds Advocacy in action where, what's the term? You put your money where your mouth is. Thank you for listening and supporting the show, sharing and leaving reviews. Apple Podcasts allows you to do that. Follow at Crime of the Truest Kind. And finally, become a patron at patreon.com slash crime of the truest kind. I will thank all of our patrons later on in this show. Today is a heavy day. Exactly 30 years ago, Holly Perrinen went missing. I will talk about that day and the days that followed. And in the second part of the show, I speak to journalist Rich Price, whose work in local news led him to Holly's case and to write and produce the podcast, Holly's Been Taken. In today's episode, episode number 47, we go to Worcester County, west of Boston, in Grafton and Sturbridge, and later in Brimfield in Hamden County. Because Holly Perrinen's murder is still unsolved 30 years later. Holly Kristen Perrinen came into the world on January 19, 1983, in Worcester, Massachusetts. She lived with her family in Grafton, a small town in Worcester County, and part of what's known as the Blackstone Valley. As of 2020, its population was just over 19,600 people. Grafton is five miles outside of Worcester, and Worcester is the second largest city in the Commonwealth after Boston. You know, in preparing this episode, I recall living in Grafton once, briefly. A friend had a place on Lake Ripple. Zillow calls it North Grafton, people familiar with this area, it was on Logan Path. I had to look it up. It was a long time ago. And the story goes that we were in between homes. We moved out of one and couldn't move into the other one right away. So a friend of ours let us stay there temporarily. It was a very kind thing to do. The 1935 film Ah Wilderness was filmed in Grafton. It starred Lionel Barrymore of the Barrymore family, and yes, great uncle of Drew Barrymore. The producers of the film had a bandstand built in the town common, where it still stands today. And Rich Price, the journalist whom I will speak to later in the episode, is former editor of Grafton News, the town paper. This podcast is about Massachusetts and New England crime stories. It is also about our people and places, the things that happen here. From Grafton, we go to Sturbridge, also in Worcester County, and 24 miles from Holly's hometown. It's a very small New England town, 9,800 people as of 2020. It's closer to the Connecticut state line than it is to the city of Worcester. And since 1946, Sturbridge has been well known as the home of Old Sturbridge Village, a tourist destination and a staple field trip location for area kids. Old Sturbridge Village 
is a recreation of an early 19th century rural New England town. It has 40 historical buildings on site and covers 200 plus acres. Oh, and there's friendly costumed historians. On Thursday, August 5th, 1993, Holly Perenin was a happy 10-year-old girl, a big sister to two brothers. She was headed to fifth grade at Grafton Middle School, where she sang in the school choir, and she was a Girl Scout. Holly, her brothers Zachary and Andrew, were enjoying a week-long midsummer vacation at their family's cottage. Holly's dad Rick brought the kids to his mother's place there in Sturbridge. It was something that they did all the time. Holly's parents had split up, and they had joint custody between Rick Perenin and mom Christina Harrington. That arrangement allowed the kids to spend several nights each week with their dad and many weekends. Rick took the kids out on the boat to swim in the lake after breakfast. Holly loved to swim. Most of us did at 10, but she really loved the water. She had just gotten her intermediate swimming certificate at 4-H camp shortly before that vacation week. Holly was a smart child, an excellent student. At 10, she was already planning to go to school in Florida to become a marine biologist. At 10, the Perenans headed back to the cottage at about 11.45 a.m. Holly, along with her little brother Zach, who was five at the time, wanted to walk up South Shore Drive, the dirt road along the lake where their cottage was. They walked a couple of hundred yards to Allen Street, one of the main roads that leads to the lake. There, they went to a fence at the back of a neighbor's yard to see some collie puppies. And because Holly loved animals, she knew they came outside at noontime. Now Holly, who was 10, was a bit more seasoned with these things. But little Zach got scared by one of the barking puppies and wanted to go back to the cottage. Holly stayed by the fence. Zachary came back alone. No Holly. It was just after 12 o'clock. Their dad gave it about 10 minutes before sending his two sons, Zach and 8-year-old Andrew, out to find her. But when they returned without Holly, that was definitely cause for alarm. Rick and the boys would drive around the lake roads looking for Holly. But she was gone. A local woman would tell investigators that she drove by the intersection of South Shore Drive and Allen Street and had seen Holly and possibly her younger brother standing by the fence close to noon. She said the kids were up on the shoulder of the dirt road by the fence of the house with the puppies about 20 feet from the paved road. This helps to set up the timeline. Their grandmother's cottage was on Quaquamquatsit Pond, also known as South Pond in Sturbridge. Not easy to say at first try for most, but it is New England, and many things here are named after our native ancestors. The lake and its surroundings was something Holly was familiar with. She was comfortable at the location, and she knew her way around. It is also the reason why her family did not believe she had gotten lost or taken off when she didn't make it back to the family cottage. Holly's grandmother's husband told the Boston Globe at the time that Holly was a very streetwise kid. And with that, I think all he really meant is that Holly was a smart girl, mature for her 10 years, and not a kid that would just take off for any reason. She knew her way around. With no sign of Holly, her dad called police and reported her missing. Reports list that as 12.51 p.m., just over one hour since he had last seen his daughter. Holly had disappeared, and the only sign of her was one red sneaker found by the side of the road near where they had been looking at the puppies. There were no eyewitnesses, and there was no evidence on the roadway of anyone coming in, peeling out, or leaving any tire tracks. The search for Holly began immediately, with more than 80 state and local police officers and firefighters searching the entire day. State police helicopters with infrared equipment kept on through the night, 
while more officers patrolled a three square mile area of where she had last been seen, but nothing. Whereabouts unknown. Rick Perenin, her dad, talked about what it was like in those hours and days that followed and how he somehow accepted the media's intrusions with grace and humor. They needed the attention. They needed to find Holly. But seeing the pink ribbons that went up after her disappearance, well, it drove him to tears every time. And when something like this happens to a family, the sense of guilt and grief is absolutely overwhelming. Finding sleep was difficult, so her parents would go out at all hours to search nearby shacks and tree houses, anywhere and everywhere someone said to check. And yes, dozens of psychics offered their services to desperate parents who'd do anything to find their daughter. They didn't find her. Summer turned to fall, and the family tried to find some normalcy. Is that possible to do? Not really, no. But they had two little boys, and they needed to try. Two and a half months passed, and on Saturday, October 23, 1993, some men who were out hunting in an Army Corps of Engineers flood control forest discovered what they believed to be human remains. The state police were called and reported to the scene. What they had found was the skull and partial skeletal remains of a child. A search of the area also turned up a child-sized t-shirt, dungarees, which is a very New England thing to say for a pair of jeans, and one sneaker near the remains of a child. But this discovery wasn't in Sturbridge. So authorities needed to determine, was this a brand new crime? Who was this child? And who did this? The remains were found in a town called Brimfield. Brimfield is in Hampton County, Massachusetts. Its population is even smaller, just over 3,600 in the 2020 census. And it hasn't grown very much since 1990. I read something somewhere where they said the town was so small that it had a part-time police force. I did try to find that information. But I do know this. They have a small department with 14 sworn police officers. A chief, a lieutenant, and 12 patrol officers. And they are hiring. So any aspiring cops listening. Brimfield, Massachusetts. Brimfield is famous in certain circles. In those circles, the term Brimfield means one thing. Brimfield Flea Market. It is the largest outdoor antiques and collectibles show around. A piece of Mass Live said this. For some reason, the Brimfield Flea Market is a gold mine of thousands of unique finds for antique and thrift shoppers. For others, it's a totally undiscovered piece of land that sits just west of the intersection of Interstate 84 and I-90. That's the Mass Pike. More than 50,000 people attend the Brimfield Flea Market each year. It runs three times a year, in May, July, and September, from Tuesday through Sunday. You can visit BrimfieldAntiqueFleaMarket.com. And yet another beautiful reason to visit New England. I'm going to go after some of that New England tourism money one day. I was recently out in that part of the state when I got Poppy. My new little baby dog. She's doing great, by the way. And many thanks to Better Together Dog Rescue of Belchertown, Massachusetts. The spot where these remains were found in Brimfield is six miles from the Sturbridge Cottage. Holly had gone missing in early August. The remains did appear to belong to a human child. And investigators were called to the scene to comb for evidence. What is sad and disgusting is something I read in a piece on Boston 25 News around the 11th anniversary of Holly's disappearance. Her mom, who was identified as Tina Harrington in the story, said, I got a phone call from a television reporter saying, can you give me any information about the body in the woods? That's how I found out. 
That is how Holly Perrinan's mom, Tina Harrington, found out that her little girl's remains were found in the woods in Brimfield three months after she disappeared. Are you fucking kidding me? But things like this happen to families all the time, and we really, really need to do better. It was Holly. She had been found after 79 days. An autopsy found that she had been murdered, and very likely in the location where the remains were found. A forensic examination of the clothing found with her would tell the story. That her clothing was removed, she was assaulted and murdered, and left out in the open in the woods of Brimfield, exposed to the elements of the heat and whatever lived in those woods. There have been at least five or six strong suspects in Holly's abduction and murder. Some named, others just suspected. Holly's case has been featured on local news for as long as I can remember. Then, seven years after Holly, another young girl from the same area went missing. A girl who would be connected to Holly's case in a few ways. First was when Holly went missing. That girl from Warren, 10 miles from Sturbridge, was Molly Bish. She had just celebrated her 10th birthday a few days before Holly went missing. When Molly heard that a little girl her same age had disappeared while visiting her grandmother in Sturbridge, she wanted to offer Holly's family comfort. So she wrote Holly Perrinan's parents a letter. It read, My name is Molly Bish. I am 10 years old. Someday I would like to come see you. I am very sorry. I wish I could make it up to you. Holly is a very pretty girl. She is almost as tall as me. I wish I knew Holly. I hope they find her. With love, Molly. Followed by several X's and O's for hugs and kisses. And she included a picture of her family. That is an incredibly kind thing for a 10-year-old to do. Molly's mother, Maggie, would say much later that Molly was very sensitive to the feelings of others. She wrote that letter on her own, and she didn't need any help. Molly Bish went missing from her lifeguard job on Commons Pond in Warren on June 27, 2000. She was 16. Three years following her disappearance, her remains were discovered a few miles from the pond in Palmer, Massachusetts. Molly's disappearance opened a lot of wounds for the Perenans, as well as other families of missing and murdered children. I have spoken about Molly's case before. That once it was discovered she was missing, an extensive search for her began. It is the largest and most expensive search for a missing person in Massachusetts history. I get all that. But what is the price for a child? Holly's case and Molly's case. Two young Massachusetts girls who were abducted and murdered remain unsolved to this day. There are many people of interest named and unnamed. Some of whom were potential links to both cases. Holly Perrinan went missing on August 5th, 1993. Exactly 30 years to the day that I tell you this story. What will it take to solve this case and the many cases like hers? I asked that of my guest. Rich Price is a journalist. He is from Holly's hometown. He investigated her case in depth. He has developed a relationship with Holly Perrinan's family and he covers her case in a podcast he calls Holly's Been Taken. I'm grateful that he agreed to speak with me about her case. And before we get started, there was some glitching in our Wi-Fi connections. So on some occasions, audio is a bit tenuous. It was something I hope to be able to repair in post, some of which I was able to. But what I will do is include the transcripts of this episode. I listened to most of your podcast. You did a lot of work on that. That's that's a lot of work. You, you... It's, it was a lot of work. 
I didn't want to do like a one-off kind of yeah. like I saw this on Wikipedia dot dot dot. Unfortunately for this true crime community, that's a lot of what we get. It is, uh, at least the popular ones, um, which shall not be named. You're absolutely right. There's a lot of that going on. And, you know, if you got to crank these things out, you're not going to be able to do a, a tremendous amount of research. You're just going to pretty much just hope you're going to get the ears that you want. I know that you have a very strong background. Are, are you a Massachusetts native? Did you grow up here? I am. I grew up in, uh, in Norwood and then um, lived in Boston. I lived uh, lived in, you know, Metro West. I moved to Minnesota for like mm -hmm. seven or eight years. And we came back and live in Grafton now. <laughs> Became um, the editor of the Grafton News, just the town paper. Yeah. And it was, you know, it was just, it was great. I, I met a lot of people and got to know a lot of people. And, and one of them ended up being a uh, Brainian family. You know, Carla Jackman was kind of the, the go-to person for the family. She was the spokesperson. Right. Her mother used to be, but now she's just kind of getting up there in years, and it's just too much. And she would send me every once in a while requests to run like an anniversary-type story, you know, yeah. if you if you know anything, call the detectives unit, that kind of stuff. So we kind of knew each other, and she works for the public school system, and I had kids in the school system, so we all, we all knew other people, and Kind of town stuff. You know, at some point, I ended up leaving the paper because the paper had been bought by uh, Gannett, long story short. So I ended up kind of just stepping down. And one thing led to another, and Carla had reached out to me, wasn't sure that I had, had stepped down. I was also looking for a project, and I ended up asking her, can I work on a podcast? Because the reality was, this case had been written about a lot at the beginning. And then there was a lot of anniversary type stories, just kind of by the book kind of stuff. And there were some television programs, some local and some from other, you know, network type shows, but none of them really did a thorough job. So I really wanted to kind of build this which uh, the first couple of episodes really was kind of, that was it about. It was like, kind of like, here we were on August 5th. Here we are in October. And now we're here because what happened is that, as, as you want to do, is that I, I wanted it to be a researched story. I didn't want it to be anything less than that. And I wanted it to, to work as hard as I could on it and to see how well I could do it. And I wanted to do it as a podcast because I figured if I... If I wrote a book, no one's going to read it. So why not try this and try something different? And I think it was the right call. I mean, I, it was, you know, I kind of listened to these episodes and I, I kind of cringe at some of the audio quality, <laughs> but I was learning as I went along. And I can tell by, you know, you have like a radio background and you have a nice mic and everything else. You, you know how to do like good audio. So I'm sure you were probably trying not to cringe too. But is, this was something that I really wanted to do. I really wanted it to really tell the story. And as it turned out, it ended up becoming also where I, I started turning rocks over. You sure did. There was an episode called The Man in the Pickup Truck. I'm not sure. Did, did you have a chance to listen to that one? I sure did. I have questions. I started turning rocks over and I started pursuing leads and I started interviewing a lot of people. And I'm talking about people who were close to the investigation I'm not talking about neighbors who said, I think I saw this. I think I saw right. that. I mean, I really want to try and get to the core as best I could. And it was that along with some other people. One was David Pouliot, who was probably the only person that was publicly named by the district attorney. There was Rodney Stanger, who was written about quite a bit in the newspaper, and he's serving time in a prison. So, I mean, these are the kinds of things that I had to kind of like vet and figure out, you know, are these people legitimate targets of interest or is this just a lot of distraction? And to me, it turned out to be that the man in the pickup truck episode was the one that was came close to the core. Because that was the suspect who, who you do not name. And maybe this is one of the questions for you. Do you not name that suspect because there's not enough 
to name them an official suspect in Holly Perrin's disappearance and murder? Well, since that person was never named by the district attorney or anyone in law enforcement uh, in a public way, Mm -hmm. for certainly for liability reasons, I certainly Mm -hmm. do not want to do it. Right. But also because for the integrity of the case, these episodes that I put out, uh, I, I'm, I'm proud of. I think they tell a good story. I know yeah. that there's, there's a, a, they're accurate. However, I also know that these are not the only names. Uh-huh. You know, there are other people that law enforcement have on their on their list. So I have to be very careful with that. And I think one of the things that I did say, perhaps in the first episode, was that this is not just a project that I'm hoping that will shed light. But it's also a project when you're you're dealing with unsolved cases like this that have been going on for three decades, that it can also be very humbling, too, you know, that I could reveal stuff that I feel really good about. And then the next day, perhaps an indictment could come and it could be somebody completely different. So it's a very humbling situation to be in. And I think about that all the time as I'm doing this. And I think about that as I'm talking to, you know, the family members, especially to be as sensitive as I possibly can and to defer to them because right. they're the ones who, are, who have to live it. And that's really one of the most important things that I've learned doing this. I mean, my background is largely in rock and roll radio to where you're always trying to get the laugh. I learned very quickly into my journey, so to speak. I went from true crime consumer, which I still am, to a true crime creator. And I learned very quickly speaking to loved ones of family members of murdered and missing people that they're not characters that belong to us to create these exploitative narratives that these people are dealing every single day with the loss of this little girl. She was 10 years old when she disappeared off the streets of her grandparents' neighborhood. Yeah. And here we are 30 years later, and we still have no better answers to solve what happened. But one of the good things is that Holly was actually found. Mm -hmm. But her case remains unsolved 30 years to the day later. How are her family members doing when you speak to them? How are they dealing? I know you said her parents have sort of stepped back from a lot of the day-to-day involvement of her disappearance and her murder. And she has a a very strong, it looks like a very strong team of other family members who are a part of this. How are they doing? And when you speak to them, what do they share with you? Well, they're doing as well, I think, as probably can be expected and under the circumstances that they live in. There are, I mean, certainly there are are some people who under these circumstances would Mm -hmm. probably couldn't be able to deal with it at all. And there are other people who probably become advocates I think to some extent after 30 years, because they do have a, a strong family and a, and a large family, that uh, if somebody needs to kind of pull back, there are other people there who will step in. And I think that, and that's certainly what's going on right now. Carla yeah. Jackman, who is um, Holly's aunt, has been very supportive of my work. She has always taken my calls. We were text each other um, a lot. So there's a lot of back and forth going on with us. And then when I had her her, cousin, her two cousins on a, a three-hour Zoom call mm-hmm. where I laid out, um, you know, essentially three, my cases with three different people, they hung in there the whole time. I mean, it was, they were, they're very strong people. And I find that to be, you know, a humbling kind of experience because you really want to do, I really want to do right by them. And put them first at all times. And one of the things I've always said to them was, uh, I'll keep turning rocks over. But, you know, if there comes a point where you don't want me to do this anymore, whether you feel that there is too much compromise with the investigation mm-hmm. or anything to that effect, I said, then then I'm going to stop. Then I'm going to yeah. stop because really yeah. it had to I really needed to have their buy in or else I wasn't going to do this at all. And that's admirable because we know a lot of people don't do that. I, I have developed a bit of a rapport with Julie Murray, who is Maura Murray's sister, and she is on the front lines every single day, even almost Mm -hmm. 20 years later of Maura's disappearance. On her worst day, when she doesn't want to do it, she soldiers on. And I love that about the Murray family because 
20 years later, and it's heartbreaking to even say that their sister's been gone for 20 years and they have no resolution to it. She hasn't been found. They have their own theories and beliefs about what happened to her. But it's an amazing amount of emotional labor. And it's incredible even for, you know, these families that have some answers, but hmm. not the answers they really need in Has, terms of Holly um, Brandon's disappearance. Is that still considered a missing person case or is that a homicide case now? Mora? Mora, I believe, is still considered a missing persons case because there has been no definitive evidence to the contrary mm. for Mora. That she's completely disappeared off the face yeah. of the earth. Yeah, and there was no indication of anything at all aside from finding her car on the side of the road in Haverhill, New Hampshire. And the family does active searches. They're constantly trying to make sure they keep Mora's name in the press. Can you talk a little bit about each of these people of interest, the ones that you feel comfortable okay. talking about? So number um, one is David Pouliot. David Pouliot, there was a, a press conference called in 2012, January of 2012, in, um, in Springfield, Massachusetts. And in that, the then uh, district attorney, Mark Mafriano, had said that uh, we have some forensic evidence that has come back positive from DNA. They had an item that they had picked up at the crime scene in Brimfield. Many years later, they were able to get a, a positive DNA match with David Pouliot. What was interesting about the press conference is that they did not name him as a suspect, nor did they name him even as a quote unquote person of interest, wow. which, you know, for those in the true crime uh, world know that that's kind of a squishy term anyway. And from that, they said basically that we want to know more about David. We know that he had, was familiar with the Brimfield area where Holly was found, and we know he was familiar in the Sturbridge area where she disappeared. And that was pretty much all they had said. So I had decided, well, I got to find out something. So I started digging. I did discover what that item was that they had tested. Uh, I did not reveal it because I know that it's still part of an, the investigation. I don't want to step on any toes there or mm -hmm. uh, upset the family. But I also found that David Pouliot was kind of, um, it just this wasn't a lot to him, really. He had died of uh, congestive heart failure, and he also had uh, cocaine use, was a kind of an underlying factor. His diet, he was a diabetic. He was pretty young, too, right? About 49? Yeah, he wasn't that old. But it, it appeared that he had some pretty serious health issues, and so he had passed away. I believe he was living with his parents at the time. He had worked um, for the city of Springfield. He had worked for you know, some other other places. He also did odd jobs, which a lot of people who kind of work for um, you know for the city, for like the Department of Public Works, which I believe is what he where he was, they'll tend to do a lot of odd jobs. It was really hard to figure out much about him. For example, his brother Gary, who was still alive, I had found out where he was living. I had his phone number. I had called multiple times and just never, never called back. I wondered if maybe perhaps the police had the same kind of issues, uh, mm -hmm. trying to put together a story on David. You know, and I also found a lot of inconsistencies in his obituary that his family had run. It said he graduated from high school. He wasn't. He was a dropout. It said he was a, a veteran um, in the Vietnam War. He wasn't. He never signed up. So he was just he was just a guy. He was just a, a, a working Joe. But there was one thing about David which made me believe that he probably was not somebody that is a real suspect. The, the crime scene is, in my mind, very large. It's well over 500 yards, point where Holly remains were actually found, to the point where probably people would access into that area off of uh, Five Bridge Road. There is separating between where she was, where she was found and the rest of the area is a very tall hill of rock and trees that separates it that you could be on one side closer to the entrance and would never be able to know what was going on on the other side. One thing that I figured out about David was that um, in the scene, it was a very popular place for people to party. There was a lot of trash everywhere. And it was a place where people could go. And because of the area access, it was easy for people to not be seen, especially in the summertime. I believe that probably where um, this evidence was found with about David, I'm guessing was probably hundreds of yards away from where Holly was actually found. And when I reviewed 
news articles about um, the press conference, the DA did, was not specific on where exactly this evidence was found. I just don't think David really is a, is a serious contender, but he was somebody they were able to make a direct link to in the area. So then there's Rodney Stanger. Rodney Stanger's name had floated around in quite a bit of uh, news articles and was somewhat of a kind of a vague connection between the Holly Perinian case and the Molly Bish case, which I'm sure you're familiar with too. Very, yes. And people like to draw parallels to that. Um, there are some investigators who believe that there is a connection between the two. I'm not convinced. I don't think the district attorney uh, in Worcester County probably believes that either. That's just my, that's my hunch. What's interesting about Stanger is that he looks a lot like the police sketch from the Molly Bish case. The same kind of um, look. But there are been other people that have been mentioned. We all know that police sketches are kind of BS. I mean, it really doesn't give us much information. People's um, memory it, is it's not completely reliable, as we learned, right? Nothing's going to be as good as a photograph. If that person had photographed that person, <laughs> right. and at the time, boy, the Molly Bish case probably would have been solved. Um, there were other things, too. Rodney had also had a connection to the to the Surbridge area. His brother had lived in a house uh, just minutes away from the crime scene. Rodney lived in the next town over. However, he was over there quite a bit. I think he was kind of a lonely guy, frankly. From what I could tell, I think Rodney had a lot of mental health issues. It certainly seems that he probably had a tremendous amount of self-medicated treatment for himself. And I think that probably stemmed with a lot of drinking and perhaps other substances. I did interview his um, former sister-in-law. She was really able to kind of debunk a lot of different things. Probably one of the most important things that I think that came about from a news article was that there, the police had gone through Rodney Stanger's trailer. He was in prison at that point. They had gone through his trailer after Crystal Morrison, who is the, the victim, after Crystal had died, her sister, Bonnie Kiernan, had then gone over years later to the, to the trailer in Florida. And she had found items that she could not explain. So child hair pieces, for the most part. She had wondered what that was. And so the speculation in the in newspapers, in local TV news, was that, you know, here we got perhaps mm -hmm. maybe he's a serial killer and he's a trophies. And I looked at that and I thought, all right, we got we to gotta figure out more here. So that's when I got in touch with his former sister-in-law. And she talked about that Crystal had a daughter from a prior relationship, that she loved that daughter, and but she had her daughter taken away, she believes probably because of her substance abuse. So because of that, she kept those as reminders. You know, there were photos that were, that are still on the on the internet of from news articles. And the, the trailers are, are, are just, there's so much stuff in the trailer. So, you know, it's easy to, to be able to see that, okay, they they just had a lot of stuff in a small <laughs> space. And so it just it just seemed to me that that story somewhat debunked. And some of the recent stuff that's coming on regarding the Molly Bish case from the um, Worcester County DA, they really seem to think that it's somebody else, even though they haven't quite uh, closed the case. They are, they're still feel very good about one particular person. But then it came down to the man in the pickup truck to me, which became uh, a tremendous amount of work because I really wanted to figure this thing out. I had got my hands on some police reports, which were after Holly had disappeared. And it showed a pickup truck that had matched the description of what uh, a teenage girl had I witnessed just minutes before Holly disappeared. Just hundreds of yards away. So it was, it was very close. There is a website that was created and I put that link up on the podcast description of my episode. And in it, you know, there was a narrative written by a team of retired investigators, which I found afterward was really pretty much just two investigators that, that pretty much put it together. And in it, they talked about this pickup truck that was going back and forth on Allen Road, which is just very close to where Holly disappeared. There was a girl going to get her mail, and this truck had come to a slow crawl and was staring at the girl to drive off. She would go back because the mail hadn't arrived, and he appeared again. 
This was moments later, just probably long enough for him to turn around somewhere and come back. And so this happened three times. And then she had then gone back to the house, went up into a bathroom, looked out the window and saw the truck once again driving past and away from the corner of Allen Road and South Shore Drive, which was where Holly was standing waiting for a litter of puppies to come out. And so the investigators, those retired investigators, concluded that because of the rural nature of this area, the low crime rate mm-hmm. that and everything else, that it to them, the person who was driving that pickup truck, the abduction and murder, Holly. Mm-hmm. In the police report that I had um, dug up, there was a pickup truck which matched the description. And then it was a person who I chose not to name and who was pulled over and was then sent on his way. After doing a lot of uh, research and interviews, I had discovered that they had checked his driver's license and found out that it, although they it came back as active, that they ran it one way when they should have run it another way. It was suspended. Keep in mind, this was 1993, so they don't have the internet. They don't have the sophisticated computer systems that they have now. That was mid-afternoon. This was roughly two to three hours after the abduction. So, you know, let me dig into who this person is and let's figure out and see if there's more to him. You know, if he's just kind of a family guy and a church going man and, and a clean record, then we got nothing, right? But that wasn't the case. I had a history of probably about 30, 35 cases on the books and which to a seasoned law enforcement is a pretty average number for a person with a criminal history. But he had a lot of petty stuff, motor vehicle stuff. He was arrested at a um, public library in the early 2000s because he was um, surfing porn websites in a public library. He got defensive. He resisted arrest. He was charged with disorderly conduct. Mm -hmm. There was certainly something interesting there. And then I also interviewed his former wife, who uh, who had divorced him shortly before Holly had disappeared. And she told me a lot of stories about him. He had a lot of sexual compulsions. Mm. He had a very hard time trying to not to come on to women, especially teenage girls. And she told me a story about that, about a neighbor who was a 17-year-old girl who was who was pregnant and her husband was 18. What was interesting also was that as I, I kind of continued to keep an eye on this person during my research, and as luck would have it, I discovered that he was due in housing court because he was being evicted from his apartment in Massachusetts. And they settled it without without a trial. Everyone was leaving. And I decided to follow him, who he was in a scooter at this point, and he was in his late 60s. Followed him and his daughter who was with him. They went to the elevator and went downstairs, got out of the elevator, I introduced myself and I said, sir, I would I would like to interview you because, um, partly because I'm certainly, I took an interest in your case today. And they're looking at me like, really? And I said, but also because I found a police officer to the area when Holly Peranian disappeared in 1993. And he kind of looked at me dumb, dumbfoundedly. At first he was kind of shocked, like, you know, how did you figure this out kind of thing. And then he, it turned into a hardened look. It turned into a really menacing look, not to sound overly dramatic. He said, basically, I had nothing to do with that case. And as I was kind of talking to him and asking questions, certain hints that were coming from his line, like, for example, I'd, I'd ask a question, and he would, you know, and he would kind of look at me like I was dumb, or he'd be like shaking his head like, whoa, what are you talking about? And I would say another thing, and he would repeat. Now, he would be lying for a lot of reasons, but it was, certainly was very interesting. So... He was being evicted because he was accused of putting his hands on a female tenant in the elevator. Mm -hmm. So here we are again, a person who has compulsions, sexual compulsions, and gets him into trouble. The icing on the cake is this. When I was talking to and and laying out my information that I had gathered to (laughs) Carla and two other family members... Carla had said he was interviewed by investigators and he identified the T-shirt that she was wearing that day. And at the time, I thought that it was a specific thing on the T-shirt that he was able, that he identified to investigators. Uh, what we found out later after the broadcast was that he it was more of a general thing. However, if uh, you're someone who is um, a criminal or if you're or, or akin to lying, being vague is certainly part of your defense. 
it also could have been something where he had disassociated since that since that moment and his memory might have been a little bit fuzzy it's really hard to say however he is as far as i am able to pull together he is the only person of interest that was able to identify what she was wearing that day and what she was wearing that day was different than what was publicized in the press it was a different item of clothing than what the press and what old newspaper article this person in the pickup truck is the same person that the boy who was 12 years old at the time spoke of correct that you talk about in that episode of your podcast thank you for bringing that up in Austin Globe's story a 12 year old boy was approached by somebody in Brimfield on Apple Road and papers of the times i guess the police chief at Brimfield said oh you know there's no connection with the Perrine case or what have you this was the day before holly mm-hmm. was found the day before so there's weird coincidence number 1 after i interviewed this person who was, who was now in his 30s and then i discovered a newspaper article from 1989 which talked about Theodore Stanger who is Rodney Stanger's father who lived in an old school bus and then i thought oh that's weird that's the same street that the 12 year old boy years later was a uh, proposition as i read the story it it interviewed a woman named Marie Shosik who lived across the street Theodore Stanger and Theodore Stanger had died suddenly in the school bus in in 1989 he had the uh, medical examiner's report said that it was uh heart issue it said Marie Shosik and i thought to myself okay Marie Shosik and i thought of Scott Shosik who was then 12 years old 1993 mm. so right at that spot where a man in a car drives up and ask a 12 year old boy if he wants to go to McDonald's the kid panics starts screaming the neighbors come out he drives off and that's the same spot that Theodore Stanger the father of Rodney Stanger had lived is that a coincidence sure could be is that eerie absolutely and the state police you know when i tried to get details from the state police they said no we're not going to we're not going to give you any information on this because it is part you know it's it's tied into the Holly Perrine case so i thought oh, okay well thanks for the sharing that that at least tells me something <laughs> i want despite it was Yay. never included in anything else prior to it right prior to you finding out about it right so that was a good thing So it it's it's just all very strange. It's all very very strange and it all continues to be un, unresolved. Does the family have suspects who they believe did this to Holly? Suspect or suspects? They have their list of people. It's probably shorter than um what the investigators have. I think that there's disagreement with who they believe within the family. The man that I profiled, the man in the pickup truck that I profiled, that person Holly's dad Rick Peranian believes that's the person that is responsible. I have one more episode in me and uh I'll tell you a little bit but it adds to it adds to kind of the the mystery is mm-hmm. the why this has not been solved. In the narrative from the two retired from the retired investigators they had said that there were two teenage girls and that they um were terrified about this person who drove up after that there was a, uh, a newspaper article written by the Worcester Telegram and from that the adult woman who was then 15 at the time had reached out to me and said I was that person who not to get the mail I wanted to try and find out who those kids were early on in my work the family asked me not to because mm. it is such a such a pivotal part of the investigation so I said okay fine I won't do it but then she shot to me and she had said something different she debunked a few things from what was in the narrative one was that she was the only one that went out to the mail she was not with someone anyone else and she said that it was not this big time moment that that the narrative had said but then she said she told me who she had ID'd and she told me who she told the police at the time and then there was a follow up investigation with current investigator and she was able to identify that person again the same person that she identified 30 years earlier in the so same person you have, it's not the same person oh i know who that person is that she's referring to it's a different person there's a lot more to this than that certainly i told the premium family i've got to do one more episode here i said before anything else 
You have so much more information to add. I have more to add to it, and I'm uh, I, so much has developed since I had that conversation. We're getting to that point too to put that episode out. So we'll see. What is it going to take to solve Holly Perina's murder? What's it going to take? Confession or, or DNA? I think at this point, DNA is going to be very difficult because she was, you know, she was she was in the woods for 79 days. A lot of evidence disappears, unfortunately. And whoever committed this crime, they certainly have not confessed, either to authorities or to anybody else. Mm-hmm. And so they're either they're either going to be able to get a confession or DNA technology is going to get to a point where they're going to be able to pin this thing down. That's how a lot of these cases, these, these cases that have been languishing for decades, are finally being solved because of scientific mm-hmm. progress. A short time ago, it was revealed, uh, a t-shirt that was found. The DA was very vague in describing where this was found, but there was a tank top that said Boston across the front that was found in the area of where Holly was found. What do you make of that? A reach? I think at the very least, it was probably an effort by the current district attorney to keep the story out there in the yeah. press. It's certainly no coincidence, I don't think, that they called the press conference in January of 2023. It was right around Holly's birthday. So it yeah. would have been her 40th birthday. I think there was certainly publicity uh, into it also. Whether or not the T-shirt has some real uh, connection there, raises the question, well, why didn't you reveal this years and years ago? Because certainly they, it seems like they couldn't find any DNA off it that was that was going to reveal anything to them. Mm-hmm. So why didn't they do it earlier? That, that's just kind of my take on it. It, yeah. it seems like it was probably meant to keep uh, her name out there, which nothing wrong with that. It's really it, important. It, As time goes on, 30 years, people have forgotten about this. And unfortunately, the people we need people, to remember. People die. People die off. And, and and memories fade. Yeah. So it gets harder and harder. And the clock is ticking for sure. The person that I profiled as the man in the pickup truck, he's older. He's in a scooter. He has a, a rash of health problems. And, you know, when you have that, I mean, the clock is ticking. You know, this guy might not be around forever, for yeah. sure. Might not be around much longer. Is this person still in the Sturbridge area that you're aware I hope so. I think so. He's lived in the area his whole life. When he was evicted, they gave him 90 days. Uh-huh. He couldn't meet the 90 days because of the housing shortage in Massachusetts. And so they had extended that a couple of times. Uh, now, it, then his luck ran out over the summertime. I don't know what his situation is right mm-hmm. now. He could be homeless. He's been homeless before. I know that. He could be homeless now. I don't. I don't know shared it with the family and I and they I'm sure I've shared it with um, the lead investigator. It's complicated. These stories they clearly don't get solved in, you know, 35 minutes plus commercials as the general public often believes how well why aren't the police doing anything? Why don't they know? It's not cut and dry ever. Well, it's also there's certainly a resource issue that's going on here too. I mean there's um, a lot of data that's been collected that talks about uh, what's referred to as clearance rates, mm. which essentially is how many murder crimes are actually solved. And over the last 30 years, that number has been dropping like a rock. Mm. In Massachusetts, it's gone from roughly 70%, which I think is probably from 1965, down to roughly 50% statewide. This is Massachusetts. But around the country, it's it's very similar numbers. Depending on what part of the country you live in, it could be a little bit higher or it could be a lot lower. In Worcester County, which is Grafton, which is Sturbridge, that number hovers around 50%. In Brimfield, where Holly was discovered, and is Hampton County, and is under the investigation is in Hampton County, the Hampton District Attorney there is uh, is running that. Their clearance rate has dropped to around 30% or so. A lot of that, I'm sure, has to do with money that they don't have the kind of resources in order to be able to keep up with all these cases. So that certainly has a lot to do with it. And that's why doing things like this, like what I've been doing, I think what you do to try and keep it, keep certain cases on top of the pile so that the investigators will continue to dig at it and dig at it. 
it's really difficult to find follow-up information sometimes about these cases. I've been trying to keep an eye on some of the more recent disappearances of people. And to find any follow-up, it's really tough. You know, really tough. This woman, Brittany T, has been missing. Is there any information <laughs> about any updates about what's going on with her case? Has she been found? Doesn't appear as though she's been located. What are we doing? No. There was a man who went missing... Bruce Crowley in Provincetown, New Year's Eve weekend, missing. What's the update with that person's case? Was he found? Is he still missing? What is anybody doing about it? How can I find out information just so I can update the public and let people know like this was solved or not? Difficult. Mm -hmm. You're very difficult. In, in Massachusetts district attorneys, as I'm, I'm sure you know, they're, they're not one for, for telling a lot of information. They really don't want to talk about it. They, they give you a lot of, uh, well, we're working on it and we've got every, all our resources on it, and et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, they, they won't give you any specifics. Mm -hmm. So it's, for families, it's, it's gut-wrenching. You know, Brittany T is certainly a great example. What, what happened to her? Yeah. What happened to Brittany T? She disappeared off the face of the earth, or so it seems. Mm -hmm. But we know that didn't, that didn't happen. Right. If something happened to her and she died suddenly out in the woods or something like that, certainly she would have been discovered by now. I so believe something. Uh, something has happened to Brittany. Something has happened to her, mm -hmm. and I, I feel for her family. And I hope that I hope they have some closure. I don't know anything about the case. There are things that the district attorney is not telling anyone. They're probably pursuing. They just haven't got to that point yet. I, I hope watching. all these cases get solved. I keep watching. I keep mm -hmm. there. There are a number. I have lists of missing persons, murdered people that I keep this constant list. My focus is New England, primarily Massachusetts, because there are so many cases. I have this constant list. There's this young woman. She was a teenage girl from Woburn, Melanie Melanson. The family believes they know. But this case has languished for years and years and years. I, I could take up so much more of your time just laundry listing this. However, Holly Perenin, 30 years unanswered questions for the family of Holly Perenin as to what happened to her. She was found 79 days later in the woods in Brimfield, not far from where she went missing. But we have not been yeah. able to solve this case. And it's going to be 30 years on Saturday, August 5th. That's right. Well, thank Can you. Can I plug my, uh, my podcast? You absolutely can, and I will make sure that everybody has all the links and how to contact you if they want to reach out to you. Absolutely. Thank you. Holly's been taken. It is on all your favorite podcast thingies, Google and Apple and yep. all the others. <laughs> Everywhere you get them. Wherever you go, Spotify, all that stuff. So Holly's been taken, and um, have a listen. If you know something, contact the Hampton District Attorney in Springfield, Massachusetts. If you go to the podcast description that I have on the episodes, there are links there, there are phone numbers there. And uh, by all means, if you know something, please reach out. We need to try to help this family. Her aging parents are gonna want some sort of resolution. I don't know how old her parents are, but I'm, I'm going to venture a guess that if they have taken themselves out of the day-to-day -day of her investigation, they're probably getting up there. They want to know what happened to their child. Probably gotten to a point where the the, the, the mental and emotional exhaustion yeah. Yeah. is is too much. It's a, it's it certainly has got to be extremely overwhelming for them. And it's not like they can just turn it off and walk away like you and I can. They wake up in the morning and it's probably the first thing in their minds. They carry that with them all the time, every moment, even though it might it might leave their mind momentarily. Always comes back. There are things that trigger family members like this. We could go mm. on about how the true crime genre re-victimizes people. That's one of the major things that I learned is that we have to treat these stories with care because these families go through things and they're victimized and they're villainized. They're blamed sometimes for the things that happen to their loved one. That's one of my major goals as somebody who is in this true crime space is to not do that and to use the powers of true crime for good. We'll continue to do the best we can. That's all That's all we can do. But I, I really appreciate you inviting me onto your show. Thank you. 
tell the story, and I'm, I'm hoping that this will, will help the fan. It needs our attention. Yeah. Thank you, Rich Price, journalist, Massachusetts native, and host and creator of Holly Has Been Taken, the multi-part series available now everywhere you listen to podcasts. And as you heard Rich say, there will be another episode to come. Holly Perenin was murdered 30 years ago. Her case remains unsolved. Now, certainly there's a number of places that you can read about her story. In addition to Rich's podcast about his investigation into the evidence surrounding her disappearance and murder, there is a website, helpholly.com, to help solve the abduction and murder of Holly Perenin in Sturbridge, Massachusetts, on August 5th, 1993. There's an anonymous tip line, 413-426-3507. Post Office Box, P.O. Box 15327, Springfield, Mass., 01115. Helpholly.com. 30 years have gone by, and we never give up hope. Because if the latest news is any indication, progress is being made to identify predators and solve more cases. We have seen it in the Gilgo Beach murders in Long Island. We've seen it in California with the Golden State Killer. We continue to see it. I'm going to continue working in my small way to contribute. Thank you for listening to the show. I appreciate your time listening to Crime of the Truest Kind. Thank you to my superstar Patreon patrons, my EPs, Lisa McColgan, Rhiannon, and Heather B. Thank you to supporters Mark with a C, Dominique, Rebecca, Devil Dog, crimeofthetruestkind.com for everything about the show, links and information that I share from each episode, and information on how to find Rich's podcast so you can listen to it in full. There's a great deal of information that he shares and interviews with her family members. Maybe I will see you in Concord, New Hampshire next week. Maybe I will see you in Austin. And then I return with season number three of Crime of the Chewest Kind. Bye, everybody. Bye. Lock your goddamn doors. I'm not kidding. (laughs) 